Hey everybody, we're talking about methods today, experimental method, and we're trying to finish up our discussion of the experimental method, and we're going to finish up with a description of significance, and we'll get into more of that a little bit when we talk about statistics. So what do we need to know for this video? Well, you're probably going to be taking some Cornell notes on this, as usual, and we're probably going to want to have our notes out so we can kind of follow along a little bit and pause if you need to. That's always a beneficial aspect, although I think you guys have been doing pretty well with time. So we're going to look at describing experimental and control groups in this part of the video. We're going to briefly talk about statistical significance and what that means, the alpha and p-value. A little bit more about that when we talk about stats. And we're going to differentiate between within subjects design and between subjects design. So remember to pause if you need to and write down questions if you need to that you can ask in class tomorrow. So let's get started. We're going to look at the experimental and control groups in this section. So let's look at the experimental group first. Now we've already talked about sampling and our population and all that good stuff. So let's say we have randomly selected a group of subjects. What we need to do now is also randomly assign a group of those subjects to our experimental group. Now, random assignment basically means we have to randomize our group of subjects again, and we have to develop a process to so each person is equally likely to get placed in either the experimental group or the control group. And by doing so, we're going to even out some of the um, variables, extraneous variables that could affect our dependent variable and we want to make sure that we have uh, more control over some of those variables and more validity in our experiment. So after random assignment occurs uh, of the two groups, the experimental group receives the special treatment that we think matters and in this case it's the independent variable. Um, this way uh, this group gets exposed to this factor um, in order to see how it affects the DV. So um, in our example, if we theorize that requiring the use of Cornell notes will enhance AP test scores, then we would require the experimental group to use Cornell notes. And this is our IV, Cornell notes. The use of Cornell notes is our independent variable. We manipulate this and we think it has an effect. So Cornell notes in our theory is going to um, help us score better uh, on our AP test, which I think it probably will if you do it. So if you have to describe the experimental group, what would you say to somebody? Use your terms, use your key terms, and try to, try to make it a process. You might want to pause here and take a moment or two to do that. The control group, on the other hand, is the other part of our sample that was randomly assigned into a control group. There are base they are our baseline or comparison group um, for the experimental group. They don't get the special treatment. They just go about their business in this study the way they normally do. Um, we, we aren't going to give them the, the Cornell Notes system, and we're just going to check out their score on the AP test so we can compare the um, control group to the experimental group to see if their scores are different. Now, the control group might, in some cases, receive a placebo. Now, as you may or may not know, a placebo is an inert substance. It should not have an effect on the DV, but in many cases, it does because people's expectations can um, lead to things like the Hawthorne effect and so forth. But in this case, uh, we might not let the students um, have any special treatment, and they might not even know they're in the study, to be honest with you. But we'll talk about placebo um, a little bit more at a different time. But a placebo is a, is a condition that should not have an impact on the DV. Um, so when we tell the students you know, what they're doing um, for the study, we say you may or may not be receiving a special condition, um, and that might be a placebo. Ooh, placebos make me happy. Okay, so let's look at our example. In our, Con our Cornell Note study example, the control group um, would not change our study habits at all. And after the AP test, we compare the scores of the experimental group that used the Cornell Notes to that of the control group to see if a significant difference exists. 
So we collect our data, we run our test, we have our data, now what? Well, we have to analyze the results, the um, average test score, for example, between one group and the next. And we have to use some powerful statistical methods in order to compare those results. Um, and we want to see if it, the results are statistically significant. Now remember, statistically significant does not mean statistically huge. What significance actually means is that whatever results we got, they're not likely to have occurred by chance. So it wasn't accidental. Any difference we get between the two group scores is likely due to the independent variable or our manipulation of that independent variable. So we use a significance test to show whether the null hypothesis is more likely correct than the research hypothesis. Got to take a close look here. Um, now notice we didn't say prove or disprove because we can't, it's very difficult to prove something or disprove something. Well, probably easier to disprove it in psychology. But we're going to use terms like support or fail to support. Do we support the, um, the hypothesis um, or do we reject the null hypothesis? And let's say we did find a difference between the experimental and control groups, that there was a statistically significant difference in scores, that the experimental group people scored better than the control group people. Are there some mistakes that we can make? Um, there's two common ones, and I, I don't think these are in our textbook, so it's pretty important to know these. There's two types of errors. Now, the type one error occurs when we reject the null hypothesis because we found a difference uh, between the two sets of scores, between the experimental and control group. We found a difference. So we reject the null because the null says there will be no difference between the two groups. And in fact, we shouldn't have found a difference. Um, there shouldn't be a difference between the two groups and it was kind of an accident or a random chance or some screw up in our experiment. Now, the likelihood of this happening is determined by the alpha level and, and we set the alpha level before we start our research. The alpha level in, in social sciences is typically 0.05 and that represents the amount of tolerable error. How much error can we feel comfortable with. This, this basically in turn means that um, if we do find a statistically significant difference that we're 95% or more confident that our results are due to the manipulation of the IV or that there's less than a 5% chance of mistake. So our confidence level, I mean, we could say we're 95 or 96, 97% sure that this result happened because of our independent variable, and that's pretty powerful. A type two error, so remember type one error is we reject the null. I remembered it basically by saying as the experimenter, I kind of want to reject the null, right? That, that would support my hypothesis, not prove it, but it would support it. So the first type of error we can make is rejecting that null hypothesis when we probably shouldn't. We see a difference, but we shouldn't have. A type two error then is kind of the opposite. We didn't reject the null hypothesis because we did not find a difference in the scores, but we actually probably should have. We, we screwed up the experiment somehow. Our sample was too small. Um, it was just by random chance that we didn't find an error or a difference between the two group scores. And we actually should have. If we had done the test again, maybe we would have found an error. So pause and review those because those questions are typically on the AP test, and, and we'll talk about those in the stats section again. So let's say we analyze. Now what do we do? We found a statistically significant um, difference. We rejected the null, which means we support our hypothesis and we're at least 95% confident. Well, then we have to write up our research. Um, we talk about our background research. We talk about our procedure. We talk about um, the results. We share the data. We discuss the results. What does it mean? Um, what did we find? Um, what would we do next time? How can this information be useful? We publish so peers in the same field can review the results and either say, ah, that's pretty important. I, I, I want to research something like this. And maybe they take it further or they don't like the results. They're like, geez, come on, really? Um, I'm going to do this research the same way because we operationalize the procedure and, with different subjects to see if they get the same results. So this is a, our, our powerful tool for making sure people stay accurate in their research and ethical. So here's a couple examples of samples of journals that we might see information in. 
Um, and that's where our professionals in our field would look. So we're going to look at just a couple of, of other terms here, not in our textbook, um, that might affect experimental design. A, a between subjects experimental design. Um, this is pretty common. This is, although it's hard to do, this is when we do randomly assign our subjects to an experimental and control group. One gets the treatment, one doesn't get the IV, and we compare between different sets of subjects. That's where they get between subjects design. This likely, you know, when we randomly assign, remember this likely distributes extraneous variables that might occur um, between the groups like intelligence. So, um, if we find a difference, it's not due to some of those extraneous variables, it's due to our IV. So this is a typical well-designed experiment as a between subjects experiment. So we test the IV and compare the results between two different sets of people. Now that's not the only design we can do. We can also do a within subjects experimental design. That's where our subjects are not different people in the experimental control group. There is no ex separate experimental, excuse me, there is no separate control group. The subjects are compared against themselves, typically in a pre-test, how do you perform before you get a special treatment, and then you get the IV. So first semester you don't use Cornell notes, second semester you do use Cornell notes, and we compare your first semester grades with your second semester grades. Um, and, and this is where extraneous variables are less likely to affect the results. So you actually compare the pre-test group to themselves later on. So those are a couple extra terms. Um, and remember the following acronym when we're trying to design a test. PQ, DHOPS, IVDIVI, and EEP. So this is kind of the method to set up an experiment. Um, so our PQ is find a research problem or question, design your experiment, form your hypothesis, operationalize your variables, and operationalize your population and sample, what was the procedure you used, operationalize your independent and dependent variables, how will you measure and manipulate, and then um, expose the subjects to the independent variable, and then analyze, like we've talked about today, and then publish. So PQ, DHOPS, EVDV, EEP, basic uh, method to design an experiment. So that's it, folks. Uh, rewind if you have to, and make sure that you check out your notes and review those a little bit later. And we will see you in class tomorrow. Good luck.